Okay. So we're going to start talking about some specific structures in the brain. And in this particular topic, we're going to focus on what are called subcortical brain structures. And these are those that lie underneath what's called the neocortex. Evolutionarily, these are considered the older parts of the brain. It's the reason why the cortex is called the neocortex, which is, of course, stands for newer cortex. Uh, in fact, if you look in species, almost every species has some of the subcortical structures we talk about. Uh, in mammals, we'll often see some cortex, but there are very few species that have as much neocortex as we have. Uh, dolphins would be one of the few exceptions. Some primates, of course, have neocortex, but nothing like what humans have. Well, we're going to talk today about these older subcortical structures, uh, which are involved in some very primary functions, um, maintaining the body of homeostasis, basic sensory processes, and movement, that sort of thing. So to give you an idea of what we're talking about, we're talking about, again, structures that lie deep within the brain. And again, these are involved in very primitive functions. The brain stem is the first of these that we'll talk about. And this is vital for our functioning. As most of you know, the brain stem is what keeps us alive. The medulla, sometimes called the medulla oblongata, is a section of at the very base of the brain stem that controls our breathing and our heartbeat. And obviously, that's particularly important to keep us alive. Anything that affects the medulla is going to have serious consequences for uh, our health and physiology. Later, when we talk about painkillers, we'll see that they actually do have an effect on the medulla. And in fact, a lot of painkillers reduce respirations, which is what can be dangerous. In fact, most people that overdose, overdose because they stop breathing. The particular formation lies within the middle of the brain stem, um, which relays sensory information and controls our arousal. So the sympathetic nervous system we talked about previously would be part of the reticular formation. So to give you an idea of what these structures look like, this would be what they look like from the back of your head. This would be sort of towards the front. There's the thalamus, actually, no, I'm sorry. I said that backwards. This would be the front, or this would be the back, and this would be the front, um, I believe. I'll we'll have to look at it here in a minute. Um, doesn't matter uh, for our purposes. You can see the reticular formation, the tear inside, the brainstem, the pons is an outcropping. Uh, you can see the medulla here. Uh, and the thalamus, which is actually at the top of the brain stem, it is a part of the brain stem, but we're going to talk about the thalamus here in a bit. Um, ah, see, I was right. This is the front, this is the back. Um, so, the thalamus, which is at the top of the brain stem, uh, is our sensory switchboard, and this is what receives information from all of our senses. And in fact, uh, if you take sensation and perception, you'll see a lot of information about the thalamus, what's called the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is critical for vision, um, the medial geniculate nucleus, which is part of uh, the, the auditory system. So all of our senses get relayed through the thalamus, with the exception of our sense of smell or olfaction. That actually goes straight to the olfactory bulb, but all the other senses go through the thalamus. The so cerebellum, which is Latin for little brain, um, sits right at the base of the brain on the um, anterior part of the uh, brain stem and is a really fascinating part of the, uh, our um, central nervous system. Uh, this is critical for coordinating movement and is involved in our spatial coordination and spatial knowledge. So our ability to do things like visualize what an object looks like rotated to a different view would occur in the cerebellum. And also our knowledge of how to get around our world. Uh, there's this really interesting study of London cab drivers where they looked at the cerebellums for new cab drivers and then uh, scanned them years later after they had learned their way to drive around London, which is obviously a bit of a crazy city to drive in. And they discovered that there was actually new growth in the cerebellum in those cab drivers compared to other control patients. Uh, there's another really interesting phenomenon that I'm sure that you've heard about but didn't know it was called the Mozart effect. Um, 
you'll probably be familiar with a line of products called Baby Einstein. Well, they were based on this particular finding, which wasn't really relevant to what Baby Einstein does. But what the Mozart effect is, is if you listen to Mozart before engaging in a task, you're better at visual spatial tasks. And it turns out the cerebellum seems to be responsible for that because listening to Mozart activates the same part of the cerebellum that you would use in mental rotation. So you can see here we have brainstem and cerebellum here at the very bottom. We're going to work our way up to what's called the limbic system. And the limbic system is an incredibly important part of uh, our functioning. The limbic system includes the amygdala, which is this almond-shaped structure here. Amygdala means almond in some dead language. The hippocampus, which is supposed to be shaped like a seahorse, but I've never seen it. Uh, the thalamus, which we just talked about, and then the basal ganglia. The hippocampus is critical for memory formation, and the basal ganglia are critical for memory, or sorry, for motor functioning. So amygdala is emotion, hippocampus is memory, thalamus is the sensory switchboard, and the basal ganglia are very important for motion. So the amygdala is uh, part of the brain that's responsible for our very primitive emotions like aggression, fear or fight or flight emotions. Uh, it's interesting because these seem to be associated with very vivid memories or even sometimes blocked memories or difficult to recall memories or over remembering such as in post-traumatic stress disorder. And you'll notice those two structures are right next to one another. So it's not surprising. I also want to point out this little uh, part right here. This is the pituitary and the hypothalamus are all right here. But right in here is also uh, the olfactory bulb. And that's the part of the brain that's responsible for our sense of smell, tied in directly with emotion and memory, um, something you probably are familiar with. So the hypothalamus, which is in here, um, is an important part of these subcortical structures. It's involved in homeostasis. We've talked about hormone release in lectures about the nervous system. And it's also involved in regulating our sense of pleasure by releasing dopamine. Finally, the hippocampus is located beneath the temporal lobe, uh, which is uh, the part of the brain sort of right behind our temple, which is why it's called the temporal lobe. This is the part of the brain that's responsible for creating our memories, or what we call memory consolidation. If you have damage to the hippocampus, particularly if you have damage to both the left and right hippocampus, uh, you end up with what's called anterior grade amnesia, and that is an inability to form new memories. Later, we're going to talk about some drugs that actually cause anterior grade amnesia for a brief period of time. So in conscious sedation procedures where uh, a patient might be sedated but need to be awake for something like having their wisdom teeth taken out or having uh, an endoscopy, which is a um, fiber optic tube put down your throat, patients are usually awake for those, but they're very unpleasant. So they'll give a drug like Versed so the patient doesn't remember any of the procedure. The basal ganglia are, of course, an important set of structures which are responsible for planning and producing movement. When we talk about Parkinson's disease and drugs to treat Parkinson's disease, we're going to be focused on the basal ganglia because this is the part of the brain that is affected by Parkinson's disease. So to give you an idea of how these all sort of fit together, if we could see through somebody's brain, this is what it would look like. We have the hippocampus wrapping around here. We have the thalamus. Down here we have the amygdala. Of course, this is all cortex. So very interesting to see how this all comes together. So that is your brief introduction to subcortical structures.